that we'll need in our context. They have been studied in the dynamics community. And so uh, in particular in the context of so-called new house phenomena. And so Anton is one of the experts in that field. And so then it was really a very natural collaboration. Uh, and it has been active for five years and I'm here today to report on very partial progress. So uh, maybe another 10 years will be necessary to answer Ron's questions completely, uh, but I'll, I'll uh, explain how that uh, situation is right now. Okay, so here's the um, overview. So the first part I'll just talk about um, basic quantum mechanics. Uh, so what you might be interested in and so what you look at and so on. Uh, then I'll look at very simple uh, models in one dimension where the environment is given by something that's aperiodically ordered. Think of a Fibonacci sequence. And so there are actually, uh, there are quite a few results that are known and I'll recall some of them. Uh, so yeah, that will be the third part. And so then uh, the fourth part will be about the model that Ron and the student uh, Shaha Ibn Damandu were studying. And so there I'll uh, explain what they observed. And then I'll also explain the partial results that are known uh, today. All right. So here's my very brief introduction. So I'm, I'm trying to give you uh, just a flavor of uh, things. So <clears throat> what are you doing? Well, uh, you are trying to model a quantum particle and it's time evolution. Okay, so the particle will be modeled by an element in some state space and then the time evolution will be given by some differential equation. So the state space essentially is this here. So you look at the square summable functions, um, well, absolute value should, the square should be summable, from ZD to C, that's little l2. And the state space really uh, is the set of C for which the sum is one. So that will be uh, the state at a given time, a C of this form where the sum is one. And you want it to be one uh, because it's supposed to be a probability distribution on ZD. Okay, so the quantum particle will not be localized in one point, but there will be a certain probability that it is in a certain point. And that probability is given by, well, if the point is N, CN absolute value squared. So that's why the sum over all points should be one because the probability to be somewhere is one. And the probability to be in some set should be obtained by just summing the individual probabilities over the point in the set. Okay, so that's our state space. And so the time evolution uh, succinctly written is like that. So you have your state at a certain time and you want to know how it changes with time. So you have to say what its time derivative does. So its time derivative times uh, i, uh, well, should also be some element in your uh, space. And uh, the element in your space that is equal to i times the time derivative is obtained from your current state by the application of some object. Okay, so that will be um, a map from state to state uh, and it's very explicit. That's the Schrodinger operator here and the equation is called Schrodinger equation. So the Schrodinger operator typically uh, is of the form uh, kinetic energy plus potential energy uh, and very explicitly in our discrete model it's uh, obtained as follows. So you take your map from ZD to C and you want to form this new uh, element. And so what you do is uh, if you um, look at some uh, site N and want to know what HC is there, then you have to sum the values of C over all the neighboring sites. Uh, and then uh, you add to that V of N times C of N. And so V is just a function on ZD that's real valued. And so that you should think of as some, um, some landscape, okay? So if you plot the graph of uh, V, then, well, you have hills and valleys, whatever. I mean, it's like a discretized landscape. So the larger V of N, the larger an obstacle there is for the particle to interact with. Okay, so uh, this is uh, basically your time evolution. Um, so this is your Schrodinger equation. You have some initial state at time zero, that would be C of zero. And naturally you're interested in what C of t does when t grows. Okay, so then um, the standard approach is to uh, do some spectral theory. So if you had a finite matrix, oh, by the way, so if you had a finite matrix H and you looked at the equation, uh, then you would try to diagonalize the matrix, right? Because 
formally uh, c uh, of t should be e to the um, minus i t h. And to compute e to the minus i t h um, of c of zero, uh, it's useful to uh, diagonalize h to form e to the minus i t h. Okay, so <coughs> diagonalization uh, for matrices you can do very conveniently if you have some symmetry, real symmetry, for example, or uh, if the matrix is Hermitian. And so that generalizes very uh, elegantly to uh, this infinite dimensional setting. And so that's just uh, what you need here. So the, the, the operator H is actually Hermitian in this sense. So L2 has an inner product, which you might know. And so with respect to that inner product, you can just uh, bring H to the other side. That's uh, what you need to get things running. And so uh, once you have that, and it follows, by the way, only from the assumption that a V is real value. That's all you need. Okay. So now, if you have your matrix, of course you want to diagonalize. Um, but what you will find on the diagonal will be the eigenvalues of the matrix. Uh, and so even if you cannot uh, diagonalize, you are still interested in eigenvalues of matrices. So again, in this infinite dimensional setting, you're still interested in that question. So here are the generalized eigenvalues. So it's just the same as in the finite dimensional setting. So you uh, subtract E uh, uh, from the diagonal elements, if you want. So you take uh, your H minus E times the identity. And you try to invert that. And if you can't, then uh, you throw E into the set. And when you're done, you call it sigma of H. That's the spectrum of H, and it's like a set of generalized eigenvalues. OK, so now for our problem where we want to know what the state does as t uh, grows, um, this is only the first step. The second and probably more important step is to uh, look at these spectral measures. So that's um, a little, uh, well, I mean, the transition from the finite dimensional uh, setting to the infinite dimensional setting is sort of more severe here. But this is really what one has to look at. So the spectral theorem tells you that if you have your H that's self-adjoint in the sense, then um, what you can do is you can apply functions to it. In fact, what we're interested in is E to the minus ITX. Um, so think of polynomials here. That you can easily form because our operators are bounded. And so you apply, say, polynomials to H. You get a new operator applied to C. Take the inner product with C, and you get a number. And so in this bounded situation, you can just um, sort of uh, apply a least representation to find measures. But even in the unbounded situation, uh, you can find these measures. Uh, but the upshot is that you have measures uh, that are associated with functions, uh, sorry, that are associated with um, H's and C's, so that if you form this object for a given function, whatever uh, space it belongs to. I mean, initially, say, polynomials and continuous functions and measurable. Uh, you can evaluate this inner product uh, by integrating the function against that measure. OK, so that looks a little fancy. But uh, it's sort of necessary because it's related to the answer to our original question. Uh, and so <clears throat> here's the answer. So right, we start with an initial state. It's a probability distribution on ZD. And then we turn on our time evolution, and that probability distribution changes. And we want to know how. So a very good initial state, for example, is a delta function at one point. Okay? So now you run your time evolution, and that delta function will not stay a delta function. It will actually spread out a little bit. And the question is, well, does it spread fast? Does it spread all the way to infinity? And so these questions you can answer by looking at the spectral measure associated with that initial state. And so uh, without being overly formal, I just want to tell you that uh, by looking at the measure, the more regular it is, uh, the faster this initially localized uh, state spreads out in space as time grows. So that's the answer. So if the measure is absolutely continuous, it spreads out quite fast. If it's pure point, uh, then it doesn't really spread out. And if it's single continuous, uh, there's some kind of intermediate behavior. I'm lying here, I know that, but it's essentially true. OK, but it, it, that's really not the point of this talk. So I, I just want to give you a sense of what the questions are, namely long time behavior of the Schrodinger equation, the relation to these spectral measures whose existence just follows from self adjointness, which in this discrete setting you get for free. In this physical language, this is extended, critical, and right. localized object. That's exactly right. <laughs>
Yes, 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 and yes. <laughs> okay, all right. So let's now. Yeah. So actually, so so he uh, knows a lot about these things. So it's actually not true. So if you're in D dimensions, uh, if you're absolutely continuous, it does not imply ballistic motion. The transport exponents are bounded from below by one over D. So only in one dimension do you get, actually get one, right? And if you're in higher dimensions, you get so in, in three dimensions one third. And so uh, Jean and Hermann Schulz-Waldes constructed examples where you have absolutely continuous measures and in fact only one, one third as a transport exponent. So no ballistic motion. Yeah, so one has to be a little careful. Ah, okay, well. <laughs> All right, so that was my general background. So now we're interested in aperiodic order. So let me start with aperiodic order in the simple setting, namely one dimension. So before we were in ZD, now we will be in Z, and so I said that this function V, the potential, models the environment, and so now we want to take an aperiodically ordered environment. So <coughs> this Z, uh, sorry, V will now uh, be such a uh, map. So again, think of a Fibonacci sequence here. And so then once we have a V, uh, we just add the Laplacian to it, and now we have H. And now we have a problem that we can study, namely the long time behavior of the Schrodinger uh, uh, equation with that h. Okay, so that's the problem we want to study. Now, <clears throat> so there are these two objects that I've introduced that are relevant to that study, namely the spectrum of h and the spectrum measures. And so in this setting, so I'm not really uh, being very specific here, I'll be a little more specific in a moment. The following two phenomena are sort of they occur. Okay, so that's the typical behavior in the aperiodically ordered setting. So the spectrum of H, uh, this set of generalized eigenvalues, is a Cantor set of zero Lebesgue measure. So, well, if you come from the finite dimensional setting, you're not shocked maybe. I mean, you have finitely many points, you pass infinite dimensions, anything can happen, fine. But if you come from sort of more classical um, quantum mechanical models, then it was quite shocking initially because the spectra of all the Schrodinger operators uh, studied before sort of quasi-periodicity uh, was introduced, they didn't have Cantor spectra. They had spectra consisting of intervals and maybe some isolated points in addition to that. So that's the opposite, right? I mean, there are three typical behaviors, isolated points, Cantor sets, and intervals, okay? And so uh, two of them were typical before. The one that was missing all of a sudden is the one that's uh, prevailing in the aperiodic order. Uh, case and that was really shocking initially. Okay, so that's uh, what you have for the spectrum. For spectral measures, they have this intermediate behavior. Okay, so spectral measures typically are purely singular continuous. In fact, because of zero Lebesgue measure here, you can already see that you cannot have any absolutely continuous component. And you can often also show that there is no point component and so it must therefore be a singular continuous. Okay, so that leads to sort of intermediate spreading in space for the, for the time-dependent Schrodinger equation, which is quite nice. Because again, this is a new phenomenon that really didn't occur before these models were introduced. Okay, <clears throat> so today I will just talk about the spectrum. So that's why I didn't really explain where the spectral measures came from. I just wanted to mention them because they are really relevant to the long time behavior of the Schrodinger equation. But the study of the spectrum is sort of the first step. And as you see here, if you can prove this statement about the spectrum, you already get some information about the measures because a small spectrum cannot uh, support uh, absolutely continuous measures. So that's half the answer to the second question. Okay, so let's uh, focus on the structure of the spectrum. So as I said, uh, we somehow want to see why Cantor sets of zero Lebesgue measure arise. So by now that's reasonably well understood. And it's really uh, a three-step procedure, okay? So the key actually consists of three steps. So the first step is to introduce a set, okay? So there is a very specific subset of the spectrum that you can introduce, so that in the second step, you show that it always has zero Lebesgue measure, okay? And third step, you show that the subset is actually equal to the spectrum, and then you're done. Okay, and this sounds stupid, I know, but this is actually how you do it. Okay, so let me explain how to do these three steps. So here's the first step. Um, so you have your potential, okay, 
And so in principle, you're interested in whether uh, a real number E is on the spectrum or not. OK, so for given potential V and for given a real number E, you for Yes? Maybe we should explain where this transformation is coming from. Uh, if people ask at the end, I'll explain that. Because it will not come up again. So, so yeah, OK, so it, it falls from, from the sky, right? So <laughs> anyway, you write down these matrices. And so there's a very natural way to explain why uh, they're uh, useful. But I think I want to save some time here. So I, I want to write down these matrices. And so uh, in principle, I want to let n grow. And then I get a sequence in n of matrices. And then I look at the norm of these products. And so the product uh, can have norm that may grow. And in fact, because our v's will be bounded, it grows at most exponentially. And the question is, does it grow exponentially? And so for that, you introduce the Lyapunov exponent. So by taking the log of the norm and dividing by n, if you get anything positive in the limit or in a lean soup, there is some exponential behavior. If there's no exponential behavior, that thing will be 0. Okay, so it's a question about whether the norms of these matrices grow exponentially or not. OK. So that's the Lyapunov exponent that you can define for any real number e. And so again, we want to identify this uh, subset of the spectrum. And so this will be our subset. So first of all, uh, we look at all the e's for which uh, we have sub-exponential growth of norms. And then we argue, and that can be done, that all these E's in the set belong to the spectrum. That's not so hard to do, but this is also something I want to. OK, so here's the first step. There's a more or less explicit set of E's that is contained in the spectrum. OK, so second step, that set has zero measure. And so that's really a very uh, far-reaching uh, result of uh, Kotani, um, published in 89. And again, I'm being sneaky here. I'm not talking about ergodic measure. So I'm still trying to make correct statements. So, <laughs> so uh, the, the theorem that I want to state is uh, that if V takes finitely many values, again, think of a Fibonacci sequence, a Stomian sequence, whatever you like. Well, those Vs will take finitely many values. They will be repetitive in the sense of uniformly recurrent, so that gaps between occurrences of factors are uniformly bounded for each word, for each factor, and aperiodic. OK, so that's sort of a good notion of aperiodic order. So I mean, you do want to model them by finitely valued sequences. Certainly, you want aperiodicity. And uniform recurrence really is a very weak notion of order. OK, so then uh, we have what we want, namely that set indeed has zero Lebesgue measure. OK, so that was step number two. And so the final step is to show that that set z is actually equal to the spectrum. OK. So <clears throat> there are two approaches. So the first approach is based on trace maps. And so that was sort of initiated in the early 80s and has been studied by a lot of people. And I will not give you complete references. I will try to acknowledge people in the room. So Jean Bélissat was heavily involved in the study of trace maps uh, for uh, substitution sequences for potentials and for Sturmian sequences. So the second approach, uh, which was pioneered by Daniel Lenz, is based on uniformity of locally constant co-cycles. Uh, so that uh, is just a sequence of buzzwords that I will not explain. But it's, uh, it's a complementary approach. Why? Well, uh, the analysis here essentially works inside the spectrum, whereas the analysis here um, works outside the spectrum. It's actually quite interesting. So. <clears throat> So to show um, that z is equal to the spectrum, what you can do is uh, you can show that each element in the spectrum belongs to z, and then you're done. And so that you can do by looking at trace maps. Okay? Now, <clears throat> the second approach, so remember your goal is to show that the spectrum is a zero measure Cantor set. So basically what you want to do is you want to show that the complement is big. Okay? So you work in the complement and show that it's big. And then you're done. OK, so these two things are really complementary. And they also give different information. So trace maps, uh, they always exist whenever you have some substitutions flo floating around. So definitely for substitutive sequences, but certainly also in s adic situations. So whenever you use substitutions to generate your uh, sequences, your potentials, these substitutions that are involved will give rise to a trace map. 
OK. And then you have a trace net that you can study. In general, it's quite involved. So it's quite technical, but it does give you a lot of information. Um, and so as I said, it has been studied since the early 1980s. And so the other approach was, uh, well, started uh, later. So actually, the initial paper is uh, due to Bert Hoff. Uh, but then there was a lot of activity uh, much later, so actually this decade. All right. So yeah. So that sort of completes uh, the three-step procedure to zero measure Cantor spectrum, just to give you an idea. Uh, so let's now uh, just quickly go through the uh, model set we can cover, because I was very nonspecific up to this point. So the first result was for the Fibonacci sequence. OK, so that's certainly the first model that you want to treat. If you're interested in this question for something that displays aperiodic order, you want to understand Fibonacci. That was the first model that was completely understood. And so uh, Schutter was sort of the, the person who proved zero measure spectrum in uh, 89. But then pretty much at the same time, Delisa and his friends proved it for all Sturmian sequences. So you notice that all of these things happened basically at the same time Kotani published that paper. Right, so that was the key input. So it, as soon as there was this one set uh, where Kotani could show that it had zero measure, people took that set and, well, showed that the spectrum is equal to it, and then that was the result. So that all happened in the same year, 89. So Kotani, Schutter, and Billy and friends. Okay, so then once you have Fibonacci, uh, certainly you want to know if you can do it for all primitive substitutions. So there's two proofs. There is a proof by uh, a Chinese group of people. And because they uh, publish in various combinations of co-authorship, I will not give you a guess as to this particular one. But they're all centered around the Wen brothers and their students. Um, and so and a, a second proof by Daniel Lenz. So they prove that for all primitive substitution sequences, you can, you can carry out this program. And in fact, what Daniel did was more general. So I mean, he could cover all linearly recurrent sequences and more. And so then the um, more or less last result uh, is due to Daniel and myself, uh, which sort of includes everything up to that point and gives many new examples. And so there is a condition due to Boschanitsan that uh, a sequence can satisfy. Um, so it's about uh, sort of, <coughs> so you look at uh, factors and you look at their, the frequencies which, which, uh, with which they occur. And so what you want is that for a sequence of lengths, for each of the elements of the sequence, you want that all factors of that length have frequency bounded uniformly by constant from below, by constant over length. Okay? So it's some <coughs> sparse condition, but then uniform uh, along the sparse sequence. And so because the condition is so weak, it's satisfied by uh, many models. And it's still sufficient to carry out this program based on uh, Daniel's approach uh, using uh, uniformity. Ah, oh, that's a good question. No, sorry. Okay, so they are they are uniquely ergodic. Uh, so in terms of complexity, well, certainly they are linearly. They are linear, the complexity is linearly bounded on a subsequence. I'm actually not sure if it's understood what you have as a general bound. So, do you know? No, I think it's open. So, <laughs> yeah. Okay. So all these models have zero measure spectrum uh, for these uh, Schrodinger operators. Okay. So now you have zero measure Cantor sets. Now, the mathematician will say, OK, I will not stop here. The physicist will actually also say that. But so the next step is to look at the dimension of that set. OK, so it's a set of zero measure. You definitely want to look at the dimension. So that's mathematically interesting. In fact, it's also physically interesting if you're interested in this uh, behavior of the Schrodinger equation. OK, so let's look at um, dimensions of counter sets. OK, so let me just uh, recall a few things that you might know, but it will add to the things that you know a few things that you may not know. So in that sense, it's good to start with the known stuff. So let's look at a Cantor set. So a Cantor set in general, so I'm looking at bounded Cantor sets. So I'm looking at compact sets, subsets of R, that have empty interior and no isolated points. OK, so I want to look at these sets. And each spectrum occurring for these, well, substitution, Sturmian, Boschanitsan, whatever, their spectra look like that. Okay. 
So because it has no isolated points, it's larger than a point, and a point is a zero dimensional object. And because it contains no intervals, uh, it's smaller than an interval, which is a one dimensional object. And so the answer is probably somewhere between zero and one as to you know, what the dimension of that set should be. And so you have to introduce notions of dimensions. And so here are the, the ones that you've probably seen before. So host of dimension is probably the, uh, the one that everybody has seen. So what you do is the following. So you take your set. Now you want to look at covers of it. So uh, a countable collection of open intervals whose union contains the set. And I want to use intervals uh, each of length at most epsilon for a given epsilon. Okay. Now for these epsilon covers, I form this sum where this is the length of the interval. And now I have an epsilon dependent quantity that grows, or at least doesn't decrease as epsilon shrinks. So I send epsilon to zero, and by monotonicity I have a limit that may be infinite. But if you take alpha large enough, it's not infinite. In fact, if alpha is bigger than um, one, then you get zero. And so you look at the infimum over all alphas, where uh, this number here is zero. That you call the house of dimension of your set. Okay, so that's one dimension that you can look at. Now, here's uh, the concept of a box counting dimension. So <clears throat> what you do is you take your set, you partition uh, the real line into intervals of length epsilon. Now, for each of these intervals of length epsilon, you ask whether the intersection with C is non empty. If it's non empty, you uh, throw your J into that set. And when you're done, you count them. OK. So that will be some integer here, because your set is bounded. So our Cs are all uh, compact sets. So that's a finite number that depends on epsilon. And so for an interval, you would get something of the order of 1 over epsilon, if you think about it. If you have something that's smaller than an interval, you should get something that's maybe of order less than 1 over epsilon. So you try powers of 1 over epsilon. OK, so you want to ask whether this behaves like a power of 1 over epsilon that may be less than 1, but certainly bigger than 0. And so this is where your dimension will come from. Because it will not, in general, behave exactly like a power. You take lim sup and lim inf, but that's essentially what you do. So you ask whether nc of epsilon behaves like 1 over epsilon to d. And then you take basically the largest, sorry, the smallest and the largest uh, between which you can sort of fit the behavior. And you call that the upper and lower box counting dimension of your set. OK, so maybe you've seen these definitions before. So there is a general uh, chain of inequalities between them. The Hausdorff dimension is always less than or equal to the lower box counting dimension. And obviously, the lower box counting dimension will be less than or equal to the upper box counting dimension. And you may have strict inequalities in both places. OK, so here are fractal dimensions. So let's now look at our favorite object. So now we will actually specialize even more. So initially, we looked at all trading operators. Now, then we were interested in aperiodic order. And now we throw up our hands and say, OK, it's, it's hard now what we're doing, namely to the study of the fractal dimension of the spectrum. Uh, let's start with the simplest example. So that will be, well, probably the simplest example. So here's now something very uh, concrete. Uh, the V here will be given by a Fibonacci sequence. So here's sort of the quasi-periodic description of a element of the hull of the Fibonacci sequence. Okay, that's what we want to use as a potential. <coughs> and so we have a corresponding operator. And in fact, this, the Fibonacci se sequence is something symbolic. So sometimes you write it down with zeros and ones, sometimes with one and twos, sometimes you take zero and a thousand. For the physical problem, it matters because if you have zero and a thousand, you have very high obstacles that you know, the particle has to deal with. If you have zero and one over a thousand, the obstacles aren't as severe. So the numerical values actually matter here. So you have to introduce this uh, parameter lambda, which essentially is the difference between the two values. Right? So if you have this description, the values are 0 and lambda. So for small lambdas, you have really a, a, a landscape with uh, tiny hills. And for large lambda, you know, they are really tall. OK. So here's your Fibonacci model. So this is the coupling parameter, but really it sort of gives you the difference between the two values. And here you have the inverse of the golden mean as uh, rotation. And so now you look at the spectrum of this thing, and it's quite easy to show that it doesn't actually depend on the uh, omega here. So it's constant on the hull. So we just denote it by sigma of lambda. 
So for the rest of the talk, we'll talk about that set, sigma of lambda. Okay. So I hope it's clear what it is. The terms, okay. So <coughs> it's uh, just specializing what we had before. So in general, you have Laplace plus potential. So uh, so initially we had it in L two Z D. Okay. So now <coughs> when D equal uh, one, then Laplace applied to some C at some n is exactly the sum of the first two terms there. That's just what it is. Okay. So. Uh, these two terms are just a Laplace applied to C at M. Okay? And so then this term here, V C at N, is just the V of N that you choose times C of N. And the V of N that we choose is the nth entry in our element in the hull of the Fibonacci sequence. Yes? Okay, <clears throat> so and then, um, well, that was just the ease for which H minus E inverse does not exist. Okay, so that's the set. So for, for this H, we look at the spectrum, and because it doesn't depend on the second parameter, we index it by the first one. So that's sigma of lambda. And so <coughs> here's a plot of it. So this is how it looks. So for lambda equal to zero, this is the lambda axis here, and this is the E axis. So if you want to have the spectrum, or if you want to have sigma lambda, for lambda equal to a half, you just have to take this slice here. Okay? So the intersection of that graph with this line will be the spectrum sigma one half. So for in particular for zero, you get the interval minus two, two, that's well known. And so what you don't see very well here, uh, but what is known, as I explained, is that immediately as you move away from zero, the slice that you get will have zero Lebesgue measure. You don't really see that in that picture. And the reason is because the dimension is very close to one, so there is a lot of dark. But really it does have zero Lebesgue measure, each slice here that's above uh, the x-axis. So the other thing that you see here is that at a number of points, these, well, tongues, if you want, emanate. And so one question in the early days was, uh, well, how, what the shape is here very close to the tip, whether there is linear opening or some other rule. And so actually, uh, that was open until recently. So that's also one of the questions we could answer. So the gap openings are all linear here. All linear. All linear, yes. Okay, so that's how the spectrum looks. So you see here that uh, initially you have an interval for lambda equal to zero. If you increase uh, lambda a little bit, well, you know we have a zero measure set, but it seems to be uh, very fat. And if you increase lambda, well, it becomes thinner and thinner. And actually, if you were to plot it for larger values of lambda, it would be so thin that eventually you don't see anything anymore. Okay, so that's what you have. That's the spectrum of the Fibonacci uh, operator, which acts like that. Okay, so <coughs> now, oh, sorry. Yeah, I should motivate the next theorem. So while the plot doesn't show the large lambda behavior, it is what it is. Namely, if you go up here and then take slices, the sets become thinner and thinner and thinner, so that eventually you don't see anything anymore. And our way of measuring you know, how big the set is, is via dimensions. So what we want to know is whether the dimension of the set goes to zero as lambda goes to infinity. And so we were actually able, with uh, Mark Embry, Anton Gowodetsky, and uh, Sergei Cherenchansev, to study this large lambda behavior of the dimension of the spectrum. So uh, in fact, the first step is to say that it doesn't matter which dimension you take. So if you have lambda greater than 16, then the three dimensions that we introduced all coincide. And really, this was just 
putting together results that were known. So we didn't really prove the theorem, but we derived it essentially from known results. So there was really no work involved. We just stated it. But once we have this equality of dimensions, uh, we can talk about the dimension of the spectrum. And the dimension of the spectrum behaves like constant over log lambda, asymptotically. OK? So it does go to 0. And in fact, it goes to 0 like a very explicit constant divided by log lambda. OK, so that uh, explains the large uh, coupling uh, asymptotic behavior of the dimension. And so let's now <coughs> go to uh, the model that Ron threw at me five years ago. So you can call it the square Fibonacci Hamiltonian. So all you do really is you take a Fibonacci Hamiltonian and you take another one and say pointwise you add values. That's all you do. So it looks like that. So it's now in Z2. So the Laplacian will be uh, a sum of four terms, right? In, in one dimension, you have two terms. In two dimensions, you have these two and these two. So it's four terms. So that's what it is. And now your potential is obtained by adding these two Fibonacci potentials. So because it's in two dimensions, uh, n has two components. The first component you throw into a Fibonacci potential. The second component you throw into another one. And then you just take the sum. Okay. So it's a very simple way of generating a two-dimensional model. It's not the most physical one, but mathematically, actually, it's quite interesting because it leads to phenomena that, well, well, you'll see. So I'll try to explain that. But my version is more the off OK, so you look at the off-diagonal one. Yes. OK. So good. So that's what it is. You just uh, do this, and you add. All right. So because you do this uh, product construction, uh, it follows that the spectrum of this two-dimensional object can be written as the arithmetic sum of the one-dimensional spectra. Okay? So the points in here all can be written as some point in here plus a certain point in here. And conversely, a point in here plus some point in here will give rise to a point in here. Okay? So that's what you have. And so that also tells you that by understanding the one-dimensional case well enough, you understand the two-dimensional case. So that's actually why, um, while you look at that model, <laughs> at least, well. So again, so, but the, the mathematics that now uh, sort of uh, comes up is non-trivial, so I have to say that. So but let me first uh, so give you the statements with which Ron piqued my interest. So <clears throat> if you look at now this set, this arithmetic sum of sigma lambda with itself, then you will see that it undergoes a number of phase transitions. It's really nice. So if you if you have a very small lambda, so in fact, uh, there is a non-trivial region so that the spectrum has no gaps. Remember, the one-dimensional spectrum is a Cantor set. It doesn't contain any intervals. So its gaps are dense. This is the opposite behavior. This set doesn't have any gaps. Okay? So that's quite nice. You have something that's sort of aperiodically ordered. And yet, there is no Cantor spectrum. OK, so that's a nice uh, observation. Now, the second regime from that lambda 1 through some lambda 2, uh, all of a sudden, some gaps open in the interval, okay, but finitely many. Okay, After that, you have infinitely many gaps, but the existence of intervals persists. That actually, as oh, well, I, don't, I will not get to that point. This is the most interesting question. If we could answer that, we would be quite happy. Um, but anyway, so the next uh, uh, region is where you have no more intervals, but still the set has positive Lebesgue measure. And finally, you have a zero Lebesgue measure if lambda is large enough. OK, so that's basically what you observe numerically. Right? You have the set sigma lambda that have a description actually via the trace map that makes it quite convenient to study them numerically. And then you just add stuff. And then you can look at the sets that you get. And then you make these observations. And then they say, whoa, OK. So let me explain some of these things in the remaining few minutes. So what I will explain is that, uh, sorry, the last statement follows from our 2008 result. And then I will explain uh, our recent result, which was sort of posted this year, that this actually can be shown rigorously. Okay? So the first and the last are now known, and the intermediate guys are not known. And the third one is the most interesting uh, in my mind. OK, so let me start with the last one. That's, that's really not so hard. So why is it uh, for lambda large enough that the spectrum has a Lebesgue measure? Well, you look at arithmetic sums of Cantor sets. 
And there's a very simple criterion. So if you take two Cantor sets, well, in our applications, uh, well, in our application, they will be the same. If the sum of their upper box counting dimensions is less than one, then their sum has zero Lebesgue measure. Okay? So that follows immediately from the definition. So if you take uh, this sum that's less than one, you can increase both terms a little bit and still stay below one. So let's do that. So let's increase both of them a little bit so that we still stay below one. Okay? But because we increase them, the definition of the upper box counting dimension tells us now that for epsilon small enough, the Cantor set CJ can be covered by epsilon to the minus DJ prime intervals of length epsilon. So this is exactly the definition of the box counting dimension. How many intervals of length epsilon do I need to cover my set? Okay. Now, <clears throat> once I know how to cover each of the sets, I certainly can find a cover of the sum by forming the sums of all these uh, things in these intervals. Right? So if I uh, want to cover C1 plus C2, I just take uh, the arithmetic sum of each interval here with each interval on the other side and sum over all combinations. Okay, so C1 plus C2 is contained in number of intervals here times number of intervals there. That's the number of combinations. And the sum of each pair is an interval of length to epsilon. Okay, all right, so you have now a cover by something uh, of this form. And so the Lebesgue measure of the cover is now easy to compute. It's this times, so two epsilon times that, as an upper bound for the Lebesgue measure. But if you form that, and remember that this sum is less than one, you see that the power is bigger than zero. Okay, so the Lebesgue measure of the cover of the set is bounded by something that you can make as small as you want. And so uh, the Lebesgue measure of that set must be zero. Okay, so very simple. So uh, once it is zero, it also has empty interior and also it's compact and has no isolated points because the individual guys already have that property. Okay, so uh, very good. But we showed that uh, the box counting dimension can be made as small as we want by taking lambda large. That's a consequence of our 2008 result that for lambda greater than lambda naught, the upper box counting dimension is less than one half. In fact, we go to zero like constant over log lambda, so eventually it will stay below one half. Okay, so once we have that, the sum is less than um, one, and we apply the lemma, and we're done. Okay, so that gives you the, the fifth region in uh, these uh, observations. For lambda large enough, you have a spectrum that's a Cantor set of zero Lebesgue measure. Okay, so I'm sorry that I'm almost out of time. Can I, uh, how many? Oh, great, okay. So because this is really the interesting thing that I would like to explain, because this is sort of where this uh, new house phenomenon input comes in. So <clears throat> we want to look at the small coupling regime now, and we want to show that the sum of the one-dimensional spectrum with itself is an interval. We need a criterion for that. And for that, the new house gap lemma is useful. So <clears throat> if you look at a Cantor set, as we have been doing, we now introduce a third sort of characteristic quantity with it. So beyond house of dimension and box counting dimension, we look at the thickness. So what's the thickness? Um, well, okay, so a, a Cantor set, how do you uh, obtain a Cantor set? Well, there are many ways, but here's one. Um, you start with an interval, and then you start removing intervals. I remove one, I remove another one, another one, another one, and I keep going. And I want in the limit to have uh, something left that doesn't contain any intervals. So that's how I uh, can think of, an, uh, of a Cantor set. It's just an interval minus a countable union of intervals. Okay, so now what does this thickness say here? So basically, <clears throat> what you really want to do is the following. Um, so as you now uh, remove this interval, you want to uh, look at the fraction between, say, uh, this interval and that interval. Okay, so, so let me uh, formalize that. I want to look at the following. So <clears throat> consider a bounded gap uh, G of C, right? So our construction is such that once I remove something that's gone, that will be a gap. Okay, so a gap has a boundary point. Uh, okay, so here. Okay, so that will be called B. And now B, on the one side there will be a gap, and on the other side there will be some part of the Cantor set. Okay, 
So now what I want to do is I want to form the interval B on the other side. So I have my point where here's a gap and there is some part of the Cantor set. And I want to go in this direction until I encounter a gap that's bigger than the one here. That's what I want to do. So form the interval starting from B through C, so not in the direction of the gap, but in the other direction, all the way to the next gap of C that is longer than G. Okay, that's called the bridge, B. All right, and then I just look at that fraction, length of the bridge over length of the gap. And I do this for all these boundaries of gaps. Okay, each boundary point will correspond to a gap and a bridge. So you walk all the way until you see a bigger gap. And you get these fractions, and you take the infimum over all these boundary points, interior boundary points of the Cantor set. That's the thickness. And so why is it useful? Well, uh, here's the gap lemma, and it says the following. So look at two Cantor sets that have thickness tau 1, tau 2. And suppose that the product of the thicknesses is greater than 1. If it is, then you have one of the following. C is contained in a gap of C2, uh, C1. C2 is contained in a gap of C1. Or they have a non-empty intersection. We'll see in a second that we're interested in the third statement. So the lemma is useful once we can exclude the first two. OK? So well, let's keep that in mind. And let me show you how uh, you can apply that. So think of a Cantor set now that has thickness greater than 1. And we want to look at C plus C. So once tau of C is greater than 1, tau of C times tau of C is also greater than 1, and the gap lemma applies. So we want to show that C plus C is an interval. Remember, that's our goal, right? So Ron said, for lambda small enough, sigma lambda plus sigma lambda is an interval. OK, we need some tool to prove that, and that will be our tool. OK. So let's look at the bottom of the set C and the top and call them C1, C2. Okay? So this will be C1. This will be C2. Okay? Now, <clears throat> of course, when we take C plus C, everything takes place in this big interval. Okay? So <clears throat> if I claim that this is an interval, I really have to show equality here. Okay? So of course, as I just said, Everything takes place in this big interval. So this inclusion, this contained in there, is obvious, if you think about it. So let's look at the other inclusion. OK. So now take an arbitrary point on the right-hand side. And we have to show that it's in the left-hand side. OK. So <clears throat> being in the left-hand side says that you're in C plus C. That's equivalent to saying, by bringing x to the other side, that 0 is in C plus C minus x. But that is c minus x minus c. OK? So let's remember that. What we want can ex be expressed in terms of um, this statement that 0 is in c minus x minus c. But 0 is obtained if there's a point here that's also in here. So x in uh, c plus c is equivalent to the intersection of two Cantor sets being non empty. Right? That was the output of the gap lemma. And so, as I said before, this is what we want. So now, we have to show that the other uh, um, possibilities actually are impossible. So <clears throat> let's look at the uh, two Cantor sets, C and X minus C. Of course, the thickness of X minus C is the same as the thickness of C. You just you know, uh, reflect and translate. That doesn't affect the thickness at all. And so the product of the thicknesses of the two Cantor sets is bigger than 1 because I assume that tau of C is bigger than 1. OK. I can apply the gap lemma, and it gives me four possibilities. So either uh, C and X minus C are totally far apart and don't talk to each other. Or, well, one is contained in a gap of the other. And so because I eliminated being in, the, in one of the infinite gaps of the other uh, in the first case, now I can look at the situation where C is contained in a finite gap of the other counter set or x minus c is contained in a finite gap of the set c. OK, so that's uh, the first possibility that one is contained in the gap, in a gap of the other guy. But then the, the last one, that's the one we want, is that c intersect x minus c is not empty. Remember, that says uh, that uh, x is in c plus c. OK, so <clears throat> the case one is impossible because uh, we assumed that x was in this interval. Now, 
suppose they are disjoint, then there are two cases. Either this is less than that, but then x is bigger than c2 plus c2, but it's not. Or this is to the right of that. Then x minus c1 is less than c1, and that says that x is less than 2c1, and that's also not true. OK, so by this assumption, the first uh, uh, guy is impossible. The other two are clearly impossible just because the length of the two things are the same and one cannot fully uh, be contained in the finite gap of the other one. OK, and that leaves four and we're done. So uh, I should be done too. So let me just uh, uh, flash the results. So I've reduced the question whether the sum of the one-dimensional spectrum with itself is an interval to a study of the thickness of that same set. We need it to be bigger than one for lambda small. And so that's why we looked at the thickness of the one-dimensional spectrum. And we showed that it's on the order of one over lambda. Okay? So there's some constant here and some constant here so that you have these inequalities. So in particular, for lambda small enough, the thickness indeed is bigger than one. And then we can apply the previous lemma and we get that the sum of the spectra is an interval. Okay, so that's the uh, corollary and that sort of confirms uh, the second fifth of your five observations. Thank you very much. <laughs>